It was the early morning hours of Sunday, January 31st, 2016, in downtown Toronto. The entertainment district was busy as everyone just finished their Saturday night clubbing. It was nearing 3 a.m. and the clubs were closing, so most people decided to call it a night, but some wanted to continue partying. That was the case for three friends, 31-year-old Stuart Douglas, 29-year-old Quinn Taylor, and 26-year-old David Eminess. The trio roamed the streets of Kensington Market, looking for an after-hours party that they could get into. They made their way onto Spadina Avenue, where they saw a large group of men standing outside of a Chinese restaurant named New Ho King. The pack of friends approached the group, seeking the directions to a local party. One of the friends, Stuart, asked one of the men for directions. Instead of getting a reply to the question, some type of altercation ensued between the two groups. One of the men ended up pulling out a gun and opened fire. Stewart was shot in his head at point blank range and fell. The shooter then targeted his friends, Quinn and David, and shot them both multiple times before they even had a chance to run. Another suspect ended up firing at the duo as well, with upwards of 15 shots being fired. Chaos ensued as people in the vicinity scrambled for cover, and within minutes, police swarmed the area. The aftermath of the shooting proved to be fatal. When emergency crews arrived, they found Stewart suffering from a gunshot wound to the head and quickly rushed him to the hospital, where he miraculously survived. His two friends wouldn't end up being as lucky. Quinn, who was struck multiple times, collapsed in the doorway of a restaurant called Sizzler Kebab but was alive when police got there. He was taken to the hospital, but unfortunately later died of his injuries. The last victim, David, was struck with a single bullet to the back of his head and was sadly pronounced dead at the scene. Two bystanders, Earl McLean and Jethro Collado, were also struck by stray gunfire, one shot in the calf and the other in the elbow. Police started to question people in the area and put together a picture of what happened. Witnesses around claimed to have saw the altercation as well as the shooting take place, but they couldn't identify the suspects. After canvassing the location, they ended up finding a handgun, presumed to be linked to the shooting, in the backyard of a home on NASA Street, just a short way away from the scene. At this point of the investigation, police didn't have much, they just knew that they had more than one person of interest. It's reported that all the victims of the shootings had no gang ties, which made a motive for the murders unclear. After almost two weeks of investigating, the police were able to acquire some surveillance video footage from around the scene. They then captured a few still images from the video, and on February 10th, 2016, they released the pictures to the media. Once the pictures reached the public, countless anonymous tips started to flood in, and within just a couple of days, the police managed to make an arrest. 25-year-old Carl Sparks McKinnon was charged with two counts of second-degree murder and three counts of attempted murder. With Kyle in custody, police continued to search for the other suspects in the group. It would be a painful start to the investigation since Kyle refused to cooperate, but him not being in the spotlight was enough of a trail for the police. They started to look into Kyle's past and discovered that he wasn't originally from Toronto, but he was from Nova Scotia. They dug a little deeper to see if he had any gang ties in either Ontario or Nova Scotia, and sure enough, they found out that he was part of a gang called the Heart of a King. Not only that, but he was actually the co-leader. Police say the Heart of a King's gang, also known as HOK, stems from a well-known gang from Halifax that goes by North Preston's Finest. Some members of the gang, including Kyle, ended up moving to Toronto at some point around 2010, and evidently brought some of their gang ties and culture with them as well. Police also said that this gang, which they referred to more as a criminal organization, was mostly active in the downtown core of Toronto, primarily the entertainment district, the same area which the double murders occurred. They were also allegedly involved in human trafficking and were connected in the adult entertainment industry. It's also alleged that they sold drugs in the area, targeting club goers with what you would call party drugs. The gang, which seemed to be under the police radar until the double murder, now found itself in the spotlight. While Kyle sat in jail and awaited trial, his gang, Heart of a King, would start to be monitored and heavily investigated over the next few months. 
Not only was the gang's operation as a whole targeted, but police had confidence that the other suspects in relation to the shooting were associated with this gang. The investigation would officially be called Project Sizzle, with a name that sounds pretty similar to the name of the restaurant where Quinn collapsed. By early June of 2016, Investigators had gathered enough evidence to be granted search warrants on multiple residences associated with the HOK gang. On the morning of June 2nd, tactical teams from 10 Ontario Police Services executed Project Sizzle and conducted 42 search warrants across GTA with even a few raids happening in Montreal. The aftermath was over 50 alleged HOK members being arrested, sharing a total of 285 charges. As a result of the raids, police managed to seize $45,000 in cash, 17 guns, two sets of body armor, jewelry, and an undisclosed amount of various drugs. They also seized personal property, estimating to be worth over $300,000, including an Escalade, Range Rover, and a Corvette. The investigation of Project Sizzle only took place for a few months, but the sting seemed to deal some damage on the operations of the heart of a king gang. With dozens of members being arrested, the police now had a fresh batch of suspects to scrutinize in relation to the double murder. Under close examination, they were able to connect members of the gang to another shooting that took place in the inner city, just a few months before the incident on Spadina Avenue. On October 31st of 2015, Halloween started off deadly as a shooting occurred during the early hours of the day. Officers were called to the area of Young and College Street at around 2.30 a.m. when someone reported a car collision. When they arrived to the scene, they found a man sitting in the driver's seat of a wrecked car, suffering a gunshot wound to his chest. Unfortunately, the victim was pronounced dead at the scene. He was identified as 25-year-old Charles Schillingford. The police concluded that Charles was shot at a different location nearby and tried to leave the area, but ended up crashing. They believed it was a targeted shooting, but they had no suspects or leads, and it remained like that for about six months, until they launched Project Sizzle. They were able to connect four HOK members to Charles' murder, one of those being Kyle, who at the time was already in jail for the two other killings. He now faced a new first-degree murder charge on top of the others. Another member who was arrested was Kyle's half-brother, 33-year-old Jamal Richardson who was known as Bambino. He would end up being a significant suspect for the police because they determined that he was the ringleader of the hearts of a king gang. He too was charged with the first degree murder of Charles, amongst 12 other charges. Jamal was the said mastermind behind the operation of the HOK gang, and he wasn't shy to show off his proceeds of crime, flaunting expensive clothing, jewelry, and even owning a Bentley. He also had some ego-fueled self-portraits painted for him, Jamal being in custody was highly detrimental to the gang, as he was basically the brain of the organization. Although the police now had charges laid in a separate shooting, they still weren't able to come up with any more leads in relation to the double murder on Spadina. Determined, they continued to investigate the leader as well as his gang, hoping they could eventually identify the second shooter, and frankly, they did. In February of 2017, Around a year after Quinn and David were killed, police had announced that they made a second arrest in connection to the murders. Jamal Bambino Richardson, who was already in jail for a while at this point, was charged with two counts of second degree murder and three counts of attempted murder, on top of his slew of previous charges. He was determined to be the second suspect who was seen firing at the men on Spadina Avenue. There was some closure for the families of the victims, as well as Toronto as a city, now that the people accused of killing two innocent men, for seemingly no reason, were now behind bars. The two half-brothers would now sit in jail and await trial for their list of heavy charges. A year or so would go by, and the pair would wait patiently for their turn in front of a judge, but not without incident. In November of 2018, Jamal would stir up some controversy in the media from behind bars. While he was in the Toronto South Detention Center in Etobicoke, Someone took a picture of him eating a gourmet steak and lobster dinner, along with a big bottle of Barks root beer, surely a luxury meal by jail standards. Above that, he's seen in the photo holding an iPhone. The picture was found on another inmate's cell phone, which was seized. Police aren't sure how he got his meal into jail, but it's clear 
that he would continue living his lavish lifestyle even while being locked up. Some months would go by and were brought into the year of 2019. In mid-January, Kyle and Jamal began their trial for the murders of Quinn and David. Over a cold weekend, a jury would hear the trial for the slaying on Spadina Avenue. Witnesses who were on the street and inside eateries in the area described what they saw and heard. None of the witnesses could identify Kyle nor Jamal as being one of the shooters that night. One piece of evidence used was the surveillance footage. Their surviving victim, who was still alive despite being shot in the head, described the person who shot him as wearing the same clothes that Jamal can be seen wearing on the images released. Another piece of evidence brought forward was the fact that before Quinn died, he told an arriving officer that the person who shot him was a mixed race man wearing a red shirt and a gold chain, apparently the same clothing seen on Kyle in the video. This dying declaration would seem to play a big factor in the case. With all the evidence put forward, it was now left to the jury to make a decision. After just two days of trial, the jury had came to a conclusion. Kyle Sparks McKinnon was found guilty of two counts of second degree murder and three counts of attempted murder. The judge gave him two concurring life sentences with no chance of parole for 22 years. His half-brother, Jamal Richardson, was surprisingly exonerated on all charges, despite the surviving victim testifying that it was Jamal who had shot him. It's alleged that there was up to eight men in the group that night, and Jamal claims that someone else was the second shooter, not him. Kyle and Jamal both still faced the first-degree murder charge for Charles Schellingford as well, but there still hasn't been a trial for that to this day. Jamal seemed to beat the double murder case, but he still had plenty of other charges to worry about. In February, just a month after his previous trial, he was once again in court to face some of the other 12 charges that he acquired during Project Sizzle. Jamal pleaded guilty to various offenses, including being the leader of a criminal organization, human and firearm trafficking, possession of a loaded firearm, as well as committing fraud over $5,000. The judge sentenced him to nine years in prison for his crimes, time he would serve while awaiting trial for his first degree murder charge. The two brothers were finally off the streets. In the end, the shooting on Spadina Avenue just seemed senseless. A group of friends were just looking for a party and ended up asking the wrong group of guys for directions. The aftermath is two innocent lives being lost, both of whom had young children and two people being sent to jail for a long time, and a lot of other lives being affected. For now, all we can say is rest in peace to those who died in this story.